Uh, good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Eric Ortiz. I'm a resident of Lowry Hill East neighborhood and a former board member of Lowry Hill East Neighborhood Association, or LENA. Thank you for joining us for this LENA talk tonight with Tesha Christensen and Melody Huffman. LENA Talks is a monthly speaker series that brings community together to discuss important community issues and spotlight amazing work being done in our community. Before we start, I just want to make a quick announcement about a community event Lena is planning for this summer. We'll have four monthly community pop-up markets at Mueller Park from June to September. I'm going to drop an interest form link in the Zoom chat with more information. If you're interested or know anyone who might be interested in participating as a vendor or sponsor, let us know and spread the word. We're looking forward to some great community building with our outdoor festival and pop-up markets this summer. Now it's time for tonight's Lena talk. The topic of Tonight's talk is rebuilding local journalism. Our speakers are Tesha and Melody, and each of them will talk about their work in running local newspapers and digital news services. Tesha will talk about her work with the Southwest Connector, and Melody will talk about her work with Southwest Voices. Both of these journalism organizations launched in the last year, and we're excited to learn more about the work they're doing and how they're helping build community. You know, some of the questions they're gonna address tonight are how are they informing and engaging our community? How are they building community, helping advance local solutions? What are the challenges of local journalism today? What are the opportunities? What has been the response from the community to these local news organizations? What impact are they making? And Tesha and Melody will answer these questions and more. Then after uh, their, their talks, uh, each of them will take questions from the community. So if you have any questions uh, for Tesha or Melody that you'd like them to answer um, that don't get addressed in their talks, uh, you can leave those questions in the Zoom chat. Uh, Tesha Christensen is the owner and editor of, um, oh, before, uh, before, uh, before we go uh, there, I just want to, um, before we introduce speakers a little bit more, just want to um, review Lena's online code of conduct. Lena is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that represents the Minneapolis community of Lowry Hill East, also known as The Wedge. We welcome discourse, but we ask that everyone here be respectful uh, when they speak or comment on Zoom and Facebook. Please respect the views of others without personal attacks. We also ask that you leave yourself on mute unless called on. If your comments are in violation of our online policy, a moderator will give you a warning. If your comments continue to violate our online code of conduct, you will be removed from the talk. Deliberately unmuting and causing a disruption, cursing, or the use of hate speech will lead to immediate removal. We're looking forward to a great talk. Um, we have two sponsors for, uh, we have three sponsors for tonight's talk. Local, uh, and they are all local business sponsors. Uh, Minneapolis Yoga, Becoming Machinic, and Sortilage. Becoming Machinic and Sortilage are owned by Jordan Peacock, a LENA board member. Becoming Machinic creates business process automation solutions for legacy IT environments on premise and in the cloud for small to mid sized businesses. Sortilage is an independent game design studio making card, board, and role playing games. Jordan is unavailable to be here tonight. Uh, he's running an indigenous alternate history role-playing game called Coyote and Crow at Tower Games. Tonight, uh, Sortilege has been running single session role-playing games for new and experienced players alike every week at Tower Games. There will be no games in May, but I'm gonna share a form and comments. And if anyone is interested in any of the mini campaigns being proposed over the summer, uh, let Jordan know. Options uh, include Jane Austen style romance, subterfuge and Dune alien style horror, pastoral fantasy, and samurai melodrama. I want to thank Jordan, Becoming Machine Again, Sword of Age for sponsoring this talk. Our other sponsor for this talk is Minneapolis Yoga. They're locally owned by Melissa Sargent, and they have served the community with hot yoga and other yoga practice for over 20 years. Their mission is to help every student improve their health and well-being. Melissa recently bought Minneapolis Yoga and has continued to grow their community. They offer in-studio classes every day. They also offer live stream online and live classes. If you haven't experienced uh, Minneapolis yoga, check it out. Melissa is looking to build more community. Whether you're new to yoga and our experienced practitioner, all are welcome at Minneapolis yoga. And there's something for everyone. Thank you, Melissa and Minneapolis yoga for sponsoring this talk and being a pillar in our community. Melissa is going to tell us a little bit more about Minneapolis yoga and their work and how they're helping build more community in Minneapolis. Melissa. Thanks, Eric, and thanks for inviting me. Um, hello, everybody. Nice to see all of you. 
Um, this is really exciting for me. I bought the studio in October of 2021. And like Eric said, it's it's been in the Uptown neighborhood um, for 20 years. And, and so it has a very strong community already. Um, but I want to grow that and, and extend it to our neighborhood specifically and start there. Um, I can't tell you how many times people walk into the studio and they say, oh my gosh, I live across the street and I didn't even know you were here. And we've been there 20 years. So just connecting with our neighbors is really important to me, especially after all of what Minneapolis has gone through. I feel like yoga is a place that people can come and take care of themselves. Um, and not only do I see that when our students come in the door, but um, before and after class, it's just really joyful for me to watch people from all different backgrounds, from the neighborhood, maybe outside the neighborhood, coming to take care of themselves. They all have that common goal. Um, and, and it makes it a really open, accepting place to be. And so we want to we want to expand that because I think it's really healthy for people to connect in that way when they're in that that type of space in their mind. Um, so some of the ideas and we're in baby steps, because like I said, I just purchased in October and um, the studio somehow some way made it through COVID and um, I'm still kind of picking up the pieces from that and getting the studio on its feet. But some of the ideas that uh, the teachers and I have are to implement classes for specific groups in the neighborhood that we feel might need and have a need such as um, people of color, having a class just for people of color to help them feel like more comfortable. Um, we don't know if that's a need and a want out there. So we're exploring that. Um, a, a class for teens. Um, sometimes teenagers want to practice, but they're maybe a little bit intimidating, intimidated to come to a yoga class that's full of adults. Um, and, and I'm also looking at uh, building scholarships and having some sliding scale fees for people who in the neighborhood want to practice, but maybe don't have the resources to practice. Um, and what I would do would be start with just our surrounding area and offer those to people that live close by um, so that we can bring more people in and um, hopefully help more people. And I hope I didn't go too long. Thanks, Eric. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Melissa. That was great. Um, look forward to, you know, supporting Minneapolis Yoga and I really encourage anyone to check it out. It's, they have a great community over there. Um, and thank you again for being a sponsor tonight. We have a great talk planned for tonight. It's going to focus on uh, rebuilding local journalism. Um, our speakers, as I mentioned earlier, are Tasha Christensen and Melody Huffman. Um, Tasha is the owner and editor of the Southwest Connector, a local newspaper uh, launched in December 2021 and covers Southwest Minneapolis. Tasha also owns TMC Publications and runs two other papers in Minneapolis the Longfellow Nokomis Messenger and the Midway Como Frogtown Monitor. Tesha believes in the importance of the local newspaper to collect the stories of the neighborhood it serves. I think there's a potential market in covering neighborhoods previously served by the now defunct Southwest Journal, previous newspaper that serves Southwest Minneapolis. Melody Huffman is the founding editor of Southwest Voices, a digital news and information service for Southwest Minneapolis. Melody joined the news organization in December 2021 after 15 year career teaching media and communication courses at Midwest universities and colleges. She's originally from the Milwaukee area and moved to Minneapolis in 2009 for a doctoral program in communication studies. In her spare time, Melody likes to play with her young nephews, bike around Minneapolis and rotate through numerous art projects. She currently lives in the East Harriet neighborhood. Tesha and Melody are going to talk about the Southwest Connector and Southwest Voices, the work they do um, with their organizations that serve Southwest Minneapolis, um, the covering uh, in the 20 neighborhoods, the 20 so neighborhoods that are in represent Southwest Minneapolis. They're gonna talk about how they view their roles in the community as a local news organization. What is their approach to covering the community when you are part of the community? Where does local news fit in the community equation? How do their local news organizations engage with the community? How are they connecting us to our community and our neighbors? How are they helping empower the community? 
and what's next for local journalism and the Southwest Connector and Southwest Voices. I want to thank both of you for being here, Tesha and Melody. Tesha, we'll start with you. Eric, just real quick, she's trying to log back in with her phone, so we'll switch to Melody first. All right, Melody, let's start with you. Excellent. Um, would you, Eric, would you like me to answer a specific question or? It's, it's really up to you. However you want to, you know, present, just talk about the work you do. Sure. You, know, you guys do great work at Southwest Voices. Just want to share a little bit about what you do. Yeah. Um, I also have a fun fact once Tesha, well, I see that Tesha's logged in. Um, I have a fun fact about Tesha and I, so I'll wait until she's back. Uh, just remind me because I want to share that with everybody. We have a connection that I don't know if she knows about. At any rate, there's a mystery for you to keep you engaged. Um, yeah, okay. So Southwest Voices, um, we're a digital only platform. Uh, just to kind of get at some of the stuff that Eric was asking us before this event, um, we are really focused on the community and really trying to highlight things that the community is interested in and also getting the voices of the community embedded in what we are covering. So an example of getting the community's voices involved in our reporting is when things that kind of shake our entire community, like when Amir Locke was killed or, you know, just today when the Department of Public, or I'm sorry, the Minnesota Department of Health released the report about the MPD, um, those are moments in which um, even if there is not a very specific community focus, we will almost immediately ask the community to respond and let us know how they're feeling about it, what perspectives they have. And then we turn it around almost as quickly as we can and we put it back online so people can see how other people are, are feeling, um, which I think is really great. And in terms of like the, the really hyper local stuff that we do, I think some of the work that I was doing today is a good example of how we roll. So a reader had told me that a local grocery uh, store had put up a closed for good sign. And so I went out and I checked it out, took some pictures, went to the, the business next door, which is a hardware store and asked them what was going on. And I got the story. Um, but the key to that is that it, it was an, a neighbor that let us know that that was an interest to them. Um, similar to the malt shop that is under construction right now on 50th and Bryant, a couple people contacted us and they were like, what's going on with this? And so we put a, we got a reporter on it right away to kind of figure out what the story was. Both of those examples too are about local businesses and something that I've heard since the Southwest Journal is closed is that people really want information about local businesses. So that's something that we prioritize um, because it's clearly a priority in the community. Um, and I'm going to just, I'm going to leave it there um, unless you want me to keep talking if Tasha's still trying to get herself on because I don't want to just keep blabbing. I'm happy to ask or answer direct questions as well. I think I'm here. <laughs> Yay! Hey, okay, hey, wait. I take my, wait, I'm going to say one more thing. Tesha, do you know that we had the same job at Anoka Ramsey Community College? Okay. All right. So the background for everybody who's like, wow. Um, right. So my last job was, I was the advisor for a, a community college student newspaper called the Campus Eye. And right before I started, Tesha had left doing the same job at the Cambridge campus of Anoka Ramsey. And so your name was like so familiar to me. And I was like, why is her name so familiar? And then I was like, oh, cause I used to see your name all over, um, you know, campus I documents and stuff at Anoka Ramsey. So we have this and weird yes. email back and forth too about um, some old stories a couple of years ago. That's right. That mm -hmm. is totally, yes. Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> we have this weird connection that we have, yeah, backgrounds in running student news, which is very similar to running community news as well. It is, it is, it's its own little community. Yes. Okay, I yield my time. I'm gonna, Tasha, you can take over. Fabulous, Could I apologize, I was logging in and so I didn't hear the specific question that we're responding to right now. There is no question, Eric just said, take it away. It just basically talk about the work you do with Southwest Connector, you know, how you engage the community. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, so the Southwest Connector is relatively new. We just came out with our first edition um, in December. 
And then in February, we started doing twice a month. Um, so we're still kind of getting a feel for the community and for the neighborhoods and um, very much in the stage where we're working on chatting with folks, um, talking to people. Um, it was really fun, uh, particularly with our first couple issues when they hit people's doorsteps. We're a print publication that is delivered to the front doors of people's homes. Um, and when people kind of um, uh, got their first edition is really when they knew that we were there, right? Um, you can't really ignore something on your doorstep. So we got a lot of really exciting comments at the time. Um, folks have missed having a news source that's really specific to Southwest. Um, and now they get various options. So um, we very much um, have kind of a different approach in that we're print first. And then we also have stuff on websites. Um, we have a Facebook page, Instagram. Um, and so we really, it, and I, I, I've um, owned and operated um, two newspapers now for about three years um, that are also community newspapers, um, the Longfellow and Comus Messenger and the Midway Como Fractal Monitor. And those are just monthlies. And so the focus for us is not breaking news. The focus is always kind of a couple steps from that where we talk about the people who are affected and we really try to look at things through the lens of community members and what they think about what's happening and also just kind of what they're doing, right? So sometimes the conversations that we have um, within the pages of the paper aren't as much about this is what I think about an issue and this is what I think about an issue. It's kind of like, this is what I'm doing and this is why. And it's kind of coming at the issue a little bit sideways, but really kind of focusing very much on um, individual people. So um, we do have a couple folks associated with the paper who are attending here tonight too. So um, I saw uh, Terry Faust is one of our photographers. He's, he um, has been taking photos for the Longfellow and Oklahoma's Messenger since before I was associated with it. Um, Jan Wilms is here um, and she's been writing. She writes for all of our publications and has for quite some time and owned her own newspaper in Montana at one point. So she's um, got tons of experience and um, information about journalism. Um, and then I believe our delivery, um, our uh, delivery manager Bjorn is also on the call. Did I, did I miss anybody folks? So I, I think it would be nice too if, uh, you know, if folks have anything, I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm, I've been in the field for a while, but I'm by no means an expert and I love to hear what other folks have to say too, so. Well, yeah, if anyone has any questions you'd like to ask Melody or Tasha, Feel free to put them in the chat. We'll, we'll ask those. Um, you know, what are, you know, launching a new uh, news service journalism, um, what are some of the challenges you guys have encountered and how have you uh, addressed those challenges? Yeah. Um, is it cool if we do the same order, Eric? I, yeah, I, that's, that's great. All right. Um, so I think one of the challenges for us is that we are digital first. So like uh, Tasha was saying, they're print first. And so we're, we're digital only right now. So that includes a website, a newsletter, Instagram, Twitter. Um, and so the footprint that we have or the visual aspect that we have in the community is a lot different than Southwest Connector. And I would be interested to hear what, what Tasha has to say about um, this challenge, which is just letting people know that we exist, right? And just getting the word out. I mean, this was something that we even struggled with at Anoka Ramsey Community College was just letting that very small community know that we existed. Um, I think an internal challenge that we have, and maybe I'd even call it a struggle, is balancing all of the voices that come into us and want to be heard, right? Um, and this happens especially around more controversial issues like public safety. So that's something that our community really wants a lot of coverage on, but how that is covered 
is different for everybody. And I would say the same thing with the Minneapolis public schools is that we got the message that there needs to be more coverage of MPS. And so we have a wonderful reporter, Melissa Whitler, who covers MPS very thoroughly, but she covers it in a certain way, right? And so if we're the news organization, if us as a news organization wants to hear different perspectives from people, um, how, how does that intersect with our reporting? And um, that's, you know, like I said, an internal challenge, but something that we're always talking about with our readers because it is so important that what they are sharing with us, we then share back with the community um, just to start dialogue. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that, I'll leave my statements for that. I'm trying not to talk too long since we, I know we don't have a, a long, a huge amount of time. So Tasha, you're it. Yeah. One of the constant challenges is there's so much going on in the community. So, so many things, so many issues, so many amazing things, so many people doing, um, just doing stuff. And mm -hmm. so the challenge is always um, with the print publication in particular, there's limited space. So what do you choose to cover? Um, when do you choose to cover it? And how do you choose to cover it? Those are some of the kind of the biggest questions that I ask myself every day. Um, how are we gonna how are we gonna manage this? Um, I think there's always the question too of how exactly are you are you gonna report on this and what kind of perspective um, are you gonna come at it from? Um, so as community members, we see what's happening with it. it, it it, through a particular lens, right? Um, and that lens is that this is our community. These are our people. This is affecting us. Um, and I think that that gives a certain strength to our reporting as well, that um, some of the other larger entities might not have when they report on what's happening in Minneapolis, right? Um, it helps us know, um, it helps us as we shape our questions. It helps us as we reach out to folks um, that we know for sources. Um, but it's also something then that we need to continually, I think, kind of check ourselves about and ask ourselves, um, should we continue to cover it this way or should we do it a different way? You know, along those lines, how big are each of your newsrooms and, and who are your reporters? You know, how do you approach you know, covering the city, you know, what, how do you decide what issues do get covered? Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, I would echo what Tesha was saying about what to prioritize, because there is just so much news that happens in our communities and that we have to, at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, choose what to cover. Uh, we have a very, I would say, a very small newsroom. So I am the editor. I am in charge of producing either through me or through freelancers, right, the content. Um, and we have, uh, so I am I am the only full-time person besides the co-founders, Andrew and Charlie. Um, and they operate in a different way as co-founders, but I am the, the only full-time employee. We have... Uh, a bunch of freelancers. We have uh, Melissa, who I mentioned, who does uh, only reporting on the Minneapolis public schools. Abdi Mohammed, he is uh, newer to the team. He focuses a lot on kind of the culture of Minneapolis or Southwest Minneapolis. So he did a wonderful piece on Urban Skillet, this new halal burger place that opened up in, in um, the edge I've learned of Lowry Hill East and Lowry Hill. Is that it? I know Hennepin is the dividing line and I you know, want to be correct about that. And then Henry Pan, they cover transportation stuff for us. Um, let me see, I don't want to, uh, oh, and then, oh, Anna, she, Anna Koning, she does, uh, she's kind of come on as our small local business reporter, which has been really helpful because again, with all the things that we have to cover, it's really nice to have people dedicated to what are called beats. So, you know, focused areas. And so she's been doing some really wonderful stuff with our local businesses and just highlighting them, like spreading the positive news around, um, which is something that our readers have definitely been like more of that, please, like more positive stuff <laughs> that's happening in our community, which is totally understandable. 
uh, Eric, you were asking about how we decide what gets covered. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, I would say that things that readers or community members ask us about, we kind of put to the, the top, right? So somebody asked me about the closed grocery store and I kind of get on that immediately. We cover <clears throat> as much MPS stuff as we can. We, um, in terms of the city council, city government, I wanted to give a shout out to Wedge Live and John Edwards because he really has that beat down and he does a really good job of, of you know, getting in depth into what the city council is doing and how it impacts this, this area of Minneapolis. Um, so unless it has something very specific to do with us, right, like the redistricting of Ward 10 and Ward 13, which will impact, you know, who is going to be your city council person, that is something that we will pick up on. But if it doesn't have, you know, a really hyper local angle, then we just have to choose to not engage with it, unfortunately. Um, but anytime a small business, any news about a small business opening, closing, getting a new permit for something is, is news for us. Um, and then, yeah, when we have a bunch, it's, you know, I'm interested to hear what Tesha has to say, because it's just like, there's 60 stories that we can cover and we have to choose 10. Um, but we try to pick the ones that are lean more positive, right? Lean more positive about our community or celebratory of our community. Um, ones that the community has requested or asked about and then ones that just have a really hyper local focus things that are going to really impact you know our community the most yeah thank you so we're really small too um i'm the only full-time uh, news person on our staff um, and then we operate with a number of different stringers and contributors um, we will be bringing on a new editor this summer um, and that person will start part-time and then grow to full-time. So we're really kind of in the process of, of building here um, and kind of um, starting and pulling in the advertising so that we can support additional staff members. So some of our um, stringers include Susan Schaefer, Chloe Peter, um, Jan Wilms, Jill Bugren, Cam Gordon, um, Abba Karnick. Um, Eric's been writing some great, um, great columns for us as well. Um, Donald Hammond, Larry um, Lavercombe, Michelle Ray, Susie Marty, and um, then Stuart Huntington's been doing some um, some cartoons for us, which is we appreciate. So some of these folks are folks who were associated before with the Southwest Journal, um, and then approached us and said that they wanted to keep um, um, being active and, and keep writing. Um, and then um, some of the folks are folks who've long been writing for our other newspapers. Um, and then some folks just approached us because they wanted to be involved. So um, I appreciate folks who live in specific communities that are able, able to write um, about them and kind of bring forth um, that hyper-local perspective. Um, um, when it comes to picking what news stories to do, uh, I'm always looking for that kind of local angle. So who can we talk to within the community to comment about something? I heard something at a um, convention once that just really stuck with me that local is whatever your readers think that it is and what affects their lives. Um, and so, within the pages of each paper, we try to have just a really big variety of um, different stories, different people, as many people as we can, um, can talk to and can have represented. Um, that's always something that we aim for. Um, and then just to kind of think about what it is that affects the lives of the people who live right here. Um, We've done quite a bit with the messenger over the last two and a half years as it relates to social justice and ra uh, racial justice and kind of the things that were birthed after George Floyd was killed. Um, because those are the things that we're talking about here. Um, those are the things that I hear from the people that I know who live here. Those are the things that I hear when I'm at the park, right? Um, and so I just try to keep 
a finger on the pulse of what the local community is talking about and, and thinking about when I um, choose which stories we're going to pursue. You know, uh, along those lines about, you know, listening to the community and what the community wants, are there any, what have you found to be the biggest issues that the community wants covered? Um, has any of that surprised you? Um, uh, for us, it would be public safety and local businesses. I don't think either of those things have surprised us. I think the way that we choose to cover public safety might surprise our readers. We, when it was a couple months ago, uh, when there was a lot of coverage about the car jackings and the auto thefts, and people really wanted more information on that. And we made a very specific choice and we even wrote an editorial about it, which is rare for us to not cover the day-to-day -day crime, right? I'm not covering the carjacking that happened outside of my house. I'm not covering the auto theft that happened next door because it was just feeding into this narrative that the Southwest was a dangerous area or that we were filled with crime. We didn't ignore the issue, we just came at it a different way. Um, where we were looking, I would say, in my words, looking at it from a much more empathetic way and in a way that was trying to get at the bigger issues, right? So like Tesha was talking about not doing breaking news, right? Um, taking a minute, and it's what I like to call slow burn journalism, and like taking a minute and trying to figure out, okay, what else is going on in our community that could be leading to this uptick in crime, right? Um, and so it's been, the responses have been great um, from the readers and we're trying to do more of that whenever, whenever possible. But, you know, I think between public safety and wanting, you know, local business news, those are, those are the two things that, that people ask for the most. I think what what we're hearing too, um, folks do of course have a lot of uh, questions and concerns about crime. Um, we hear from the folks who wanna talk more about the Hennepin Avenue reconstruction. They wanna talk about the E-line coming through um, and how that's gonna affect the businesses in Linden Hills. That was one of our, the first stories that we wrote. Um, we hear from folks who are concerned about what's happening with their neighborhood organizations and um, how funding has been cut there. Um, we hear that folks uh, uh, in our last issue, um, Larry wrote a column about the guitar program at Southwest High School being saved. And that is something that uh, folks really appreciated hearing, right? Um, and I think because that's a, that was a feel good story, that was a story very deeply rooted in the community and in that school that folks love. Um, you know, I think having something like that, I appreciated it right after we went through the strike, <laughs> right? <laughs> that was a really big thing here. Um, in our community. Um, and so, I, yeah, I, I think for me, it just, again, kind of comes down to, these are all the, the things that are happening in our community. These are the people, the things that people want to talk about. Um, um, this is what we hear at the grocery store. So this is what we're gonna work on covering. And we have a question here from Kevin uh, O'Hara uh, about Lindale Avenue traffic safety improvements that are underway. Uh, do either of you, uh, Tesha or Melody, have you heard from the county on why the median at 27th and Lindale seems to still allow left turns at 27th? Adam. I have not, but like I said in the chat, thank you, Kevin. I need. I just realized that that was like officially what was happening yesterday. Um, whether John Edwards or I broke the news is still up for debate. But uh, I'll call. Yeah, we'll call Hennepin County. I'm not sure. <clears throat> Tasha, did you look into it at all? I have not. Yeah. To that. Thanks, Melody. Yeah, I just noted. Well, yeah, I think I saw it from you and then John and um, then walked today. So yeah, you win. 
Well, I was really confused when I drove. So if people aren't familiar, like Lindale at those two intersections is like extremely dangerous. And they've been trying to have people not turn left. And this is such a great example of like hyper local journalism that like really matters that we pay a lot of attention to. Um, and so I've been keeping an eye on the construction because Lindale is like a major thoroughfare and it's very dangerous. And um, yeah, they're, they put up a median in between on, tw- on Lindale at 25th, so you can't turn left there. And they were supposed to do it for 27th too, but now that the, it's been constructed, people are, the community is noticing that there's this thoroughfare. So that is obviously like a, a you know, a ding, ding, ding for us to, to look into it. So thank you, Kevin, for that. Um, sometimes I forget, this is probably maybe not the best thing to say. Sometimes I forget that I can just like call and ask, you know, instead of just wondering, cause I, you know, I haven't, I was in the community college world for so long. And then, so my life as a resident here was like, yeah, I don't know. Gosh, I'm curious about that. And it's like, well, if I call, nobody's going to answer my call, but now it's like, oh, actually I, I should, I should call. So thank you, Kevin. And I will obviously share it with everybody once I know the answer, if we get an answer, that's the other thing. This is the great thing about local news, you know, and community news is so important, you know, to get the community has questions, local news organizations can help answer those questions. Um, I have another question here. Um, Do either of you see any place for national news in a community paper? Tasha, did you want to start with this one? Because I liked what you were saying about at that convention about the local is whatever the reader thinks it is. Right. (laughs) That's what I was just thinking too. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Riff on yeah, that. so I, I do see a place for national news, um, again, through the lens of what local folks think about it and and kind of what they're doing about it. Um, you know, sometimes these, these big issues, um, with these big issues, sometimes it uh, spurs somebody to write, start a nonprofit or start just an effort with their friends. Um, and those are the kinds of things then that we, we like to talk about. Um, for other things, sometimes I reach out to various folks within the community and I say, hey, would you like to, to send in a guest um, column? Um, I'm not, you know, we've we're on our eighth issue here for the Southwest Connector, so I'm not coming up with any great... Um, examples. For the connector, for the messenger, we just had a local person contact me and say, hey, I was in the Peace Corps in the Ukraine, and I'm just really, um, what's happening over there is just breaking my heart, and I'd really like to talk about my connection to that space. And I was so glad that he had reached out and offered to do that, because I think that that adds so much value to, to our coverage and to our paper. And it's something that a lot of people are following and watching and thinking about. And so to be able to tie that and have somebody give these, um, you know, really personal reflections on that, um, I really appreciate. We've also been running um, a series on um, called Voices Against Violence, which really looks at domestic violence um, and particularly in the way that it uh, um, affects families in family court. Um, and that is, for one, it, it's it's hard to write about. It's hard to get people to go on record. And so the various folks um, that we featured in general have been uh, a fair amount of anonymous folks. Um, and they don't, they may or may not live in, in the community. Um, but these are issues that are affecting a lot of families today. Um, and so it's something that, that we, we write about um, and kind of bring to the forefront. I, a lot of what we do, I feel like, is adding to a conversation. So we're helping people connect with other folks and we're, we're adding information um, that folks can then take and continue to talk about and think about and pull in stuff from other places as well. Uh, I don't have much to add to that because we we do the same thing. Like I was just thinking about the Ukraine invasion, however you want to call it. Um, and so people have written about that. Like if they submit 
op-eds or columns, we're happy to run those. Um, uplifting fundraisers. So the Granada Theater is having a fundraiser for Ukraine tonight. So we make sure that we uplift that kind of stuff. Um, but I will say we are very dedicated to hyper local stuff. So it is it is rare for us to go beyond the scope of what's happening here. But I think that's, you know, the discussions that we're having here are a lot of the times national, um, especially regarding racial justice and social justice. Um, it's just, it just so happens that we are, you know, for better or worse, or however you want to put it, at the epicenter of some of that racial justice work uh, with the killing of George Floyd and Amir Locke. And so the attention is very much on us right now. But, you know, the things that we talk about, like at Minneapolis Public Schools, funding, the lack of funding that's coming from the state. I mean, that is something that a lot of different states and um, school districts are dealing with nationwide. But we do, you know, in terms of just kind of like prioritizing stuff, we, we try to keep it as, as hyper local as possible. But that's you know, why it's important. The line. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go I ahead. Just, I was just going to say that's why it's important that there are so many different news organizations locally here because we can, there is so much to cover. And so if Tesha is taking a much more, like doing more national or international work, right? That's great because one news organization cannot cover it all. And so I really, really appreciate how we have so many, you know, growing community news organizations that are all kind of doing different things. And so some of you might see us all as competitors and financially, I guess we are, but that's not how we view other news organizations in Minneapolis. We very much view them as like all of us doing similar work. And I'm talking about community news. I'm not talking about the Star Tribune or the Pioneer Press, but like we're all in it together. We're all trying to bring the community information that's going to help them become better informed citizens. And so it's been, it's really great that we can kind of all do different things at the same time. Yes, I agree with that. <laughs> I love all the different um, options out there for news these days that, that we have here in the Twin Cities. I, I tell folks um, when they ask if uh, there's room for, for you know, another newspaper or there's if uh, newspapers are gonna survive news organizations here in the Twin Cities. And I say, yes, here in the Twin Cities, for sure. We like our news here. We um, like to stay informed and we like to know what's going on. Um, the Minnesota Newspaper Association um, just started publicizing a newspaper readership study that they did. Um, and it was so much fun <laughs> to, to learn the results of that. Um, what they found was every month, almost 3.9 million active consumers or 86% of Minnesota adults read local print or digital newspapers. 86%. Big number. That's a positive. That's encouraging. Yeah. You know, along those lines, just what are what are your the business models for both of both of your organizations? You know, it, it's both of the news that you provide is free. So how are you? Um, you know, what is the source of your funding and your business models? So I'm only going to talk very briefly about this because Andrew and Charlie are, they're the business people. And actually in my interview, I was like, if I can be involved in less financial stuff that for the better, I can tell you though, that we are doing kind of a multi-prong approach where it's <clears throat> uh, membership and thank you for sending out that link earlier people who want to be members. So it's kind of like the NPR uh, model where it's like, we don't have a paywall. So if you want to be a member to support us, excellent. But what you're doing is funding <clears throat> our news production so that other people can access it for free, which I really love. Um, advertising and sponsorships, like Tesha was saying, like we are growing that, we're building that. So we're trying to hire a salesperson um, that can really just dedicate themselves to that. Uh, again, we're focusing on very small, or not very small, but hyper-local small businesses that we want to have as our sponsors or our advertisers. And then we also started talking about uh, having events, right? Paid events where that will help us raise money as well. Because we're, you know, such a baby organization, some of our ideas are bigger than we can handle right now as such a small team. And so we're in this moment where it's like, and this is outside of my realm of expertise, right? Um, the like, 
we want to grow. So how do we grow? Do we like hire more people that might be financially, I don't want to say risky, but like, you know, taking more money from our pot than we might be comfortable with to help us grow, right? Um, or do we say small and hope that advertising will help us expand? So it's um, it's interesting. I've, I've read a lot about startup companies and, I, and now I'm involved in one. And so it's, uh, it's, it's not, I will say that like, I'm not worried about us financially at all. Like Tesha said, our, the Minnesota readership is so strong. Like people want to be informed and they support local news very much. So I don't think we, pers personally, I don't think we ask our readers enough to donate money to us. Um, there's lots of different reasons for that. Uh, we don't want to be seen as like pushy and, you know, have that be the, the focus. But, you know, we haven't even begun like a fundraising drive yet. And I can only imagine what's going to happen if, if we start that as a focus because people want to support us. So yeah, we're growing and we're, we're, we're just cause we're a baby organization. All this stuff is kind of growing as we are. So, um, our, um, setup is primarily, it's, it's pretty much all advertising based. So we're very much the traditional model, um, with print advertising and then some online advertising as well. Um, and I think it's a good model. <laughs> it's one that stood the test of time and um, we're, uh, we're, our ads are growing for our um, other publications that have been around and we're starting to see more ads come in um, for the Southwest Connectors, more people, um, more businesses learn that we're here. Um, again, the survey that the Minnesota Newspaper Association just did um, asked people what they thought about advertising in newspapers, and 80% of the folks who were surveyed said that they believe that newspaper advertising is important. Um, and 57 used print and digital newspapers to decide what products to buy. We kind of talk about um, how there's a little bit of the trust of a newspaper rubs off on the folks who advertise with us, right? And they get some of that credibility. So whereas if they advertise just kind of any place online, people may or may not click on what they're doing um, because they don't necessarily trust the source. But if they're coming from a newspaper website and they see someone who's advertising there, they're, they're gonna trust that, that advertiser. Um, one of the other things that I have found super interesting um, is the average ad recall. So when people see an ad in print, they remember it. Um, so 54% say that they can remember what that ad is versus, um, I, I don't have the, the data here, but I, I know for me, if I see something most of the time, I don't know where I saw it, right? Did I see it on Facebook? Did I see it on Instagram? Did it come in the mail? Um, but if it's in a newspaper and I saw something, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my scissors and I'm going to clip it out and I'm going to put it to my fridge so that I can remember that uh, the first week of May, I'm going to go um, buy ice cream at the grocery, at the Seward Co-op, right? I mean, um, so those are the kinds of things. It's, it's very very tangible. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we're seeing a shift here from people relying just on social media for um, to get word out about their businesses and their events. Because what we're finding is people don't really want to be on social media as much. We have been online too much. Um, we don't want to spend all of our time on social media. And a lot of people really feel like the ads on social media are really invasive. They haven't given, it's not permission-based advertising. Whereas with the newspaper, we have permission-based advertising. People expect and want advertising with their newspaper. And that's an essential part of the recipe um, that a newspaper is. It's, you get, you get the news, you get the stories, you get the features, you might get a crossword puzzle, right? You get your classifieds and you get um, ads and that's just, part of the soup and it's something that people appreciate and like. Yeah, I just, I'll oh, go ahead. Go no, ahead, Barrick, you go. Oh, no, go, please. Okay, I just wanted to uh, verbalize something that I put in the chat as Tesha was talking about like how successful print ads are. It's, it, um, 
I just wanted to share this as a reflection, something that we've realized is that people, local businesses are really hesitant about doing digital ads, which is fascinating. I think what Tesha was just sharing about people wanting to be off social media, not trusting it, um, but also the concept of advertising digitally is new to people. Um, whereas like with, with print ads, it's something that people are very used to. They're very comfortable. They might've grown up um, reading print newspapers where they would see the ads all the time. I think the culture that is embedded in print ads was uh, spoken well of by, by Tesha. And so it's been really fascinating because even though we have stats, you know, that we can say like, this percent of people open up our newsletter every day, this percent of people click on stuff. Even if we had like the best, you know, stats to show them, they will be hesitant to get digital ads before they will print ads, um, which was, I think, surprising to me. But as Tesh is talking about, you know, the print journalism world, which I'm very familiar with too, it maintains itself as this trustworthy canonical form of publication, not for everybody, but for some people, um, for a lot of people. And so that's just been a really interesting learning curve um, in terms of the, the money side of things. And I did want, cause Steve asked um, earlier about demographics and asked like 80% renters. We um, haven't done like an audience survey yet. So we don't know, we don't collect data on people. So we're not really sure. Um, and that's something that we have to think about doing. Um, and it's hard to know because like the loudest voice is not always the collective voice. So that's something that we're looking into, but I will say in terms of an audience that we're trying to touch on, we are trying to get out of the stereotype that Southwest Minneapolis means like the lower Southwest corner, like Ward 13, because it goes, as we all know, it goes all the way up to Stephen Square, Lowry, Lowry Hill East. Um, and so when I'm writing for people, like in my head, Steve, I really, I do think about renters. I do think about um, working to middle-class people um, when I write. And that's not, not every writer has that audience in mind, but that really is the audience that I think of. Um, so it will be interesting when we get demographic data to see how that, that bears out. And you just started the feature on laundromats, which I, I love. <laughs> I just love. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that one's fun. You know, we have time for one more question. Uh, just want to, you know, get, what are the, you know, local journalism across the country? It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's difficult, challenging. What are encouraging signs that you, you have seen and, and that the future holds, you know, that you have um, for building, you know, Southwest Connector and Southwest Voices to, to keep building, you know, your organizations and also to, to build community? I'm super excited about the future of journalism. Um, I've seen studies that show that Gen Z is more likely to read print only than digital only. Um, we've been seen, um, uh, we know that seven out of 10 people here locally um, look for, for news. Um, I think a lot changed when COVID hit too and folks who for a while had just been saying, oh, you know, um, I don't know about newspapers, but when COVID hit and everybody was at home, um, the newspaper was something that they were still getting and it was a way to stay connected to the community. And I think folks remembered the value that they um, once knew about newspapers. Um, uh, uh, the older generation, right, remembered getting newspapers and they, they wanted that back. And then younger folks were just tired of being online all the time and they wanted something really tangible to hold and to see. Um, that's showing my print bias right there. <laughs> I do love print. Um, but in all, overall, we, we're just reminded that we, it's important for us to know what's happening on our street. It's important for us to know what's happening in our neighborhood. It's important to, for us to know what's happening in our community and our neighborhood news sources can give us um, that, uh, that information and that feeling of connectedness. To answer that question about the state of you know, journalism nationally, I would add to what Tesha was saying as, and I also have like a print bias too, even though I work for a digital only, um, I do like a good print news 
paper. Uh, but uh, the other thing that I have noticed, even locally, is that um, there is distrust with news. But I think the people that the thing that dis that people distrust is the corporate news that um, feels like very up here, where you you have reporters that like come in like kind of helicopter in to cover things and then leave right and i i know a lot of people felt that way during the george floyd uprising right all of a sudden all these reporters were buzzing around they didn't look like the people that lived around here um and so i think that distrust in the corporate news sector doesn't mean that they distrust news completely they still want the news but i think people have this really um they want news that is covered by the community for the community. And so in our world, we're doing great, right? I think a lot of the distrust is for, for corporate news and um, it is reassuring for people when they see people in the community doing the reporting, right? That they're like already in the neighborhood hanging out. Um, and so that's why like Tesha at the beginning was talking about like what she's hearing at the grocery store and, and all that stuff. And that is like the kind of journalism that we do too, is like, we're just out in the neighborhood and when you're just out and about you find these stories and you find these things to report that's not something that corporate news does and that's fine that's not their deal um but it's very clear that people want this kind of community driven news that we're doing so high five to us definitely <laughs> definitely want to thank you um, for the great work you're doing both of you uh, and with your organizations and thank you melody um for being here tonight and thank you tesha for taking the time to be here tonight um for this great talk uh, for sharing your expertise and insights on this important topic. Um, I also thank Melissa Sargent and Minneapolis Yoga, Jordan Peacock, Coming Machine Against Orlidge for being our sponsors tonight. I want to thank everyone who joined us in the audience for participating in this Lena talk. If you know someone who wasn't able to join us, we will be uh, sharing a link to this video with a recording once it's available and encourage others to support local journalism. You know, share this video um, and share the great work that uh, and support the great work that Tesha and Melody are doing with Southwest Connector and Southwest Voices. This is an important moment for Minneapolis and the world. Our communities can help come up with solutions to the challenges we face. Local journalism plays an important role in our communities. Great local journalism can help make our communities stronger. Great things happen in communities when people work together and come together to build community. We need to keep bringing people together and working together to come up with solutions that help all of Minneapolis. That's why the work Tesha, Melody, Melissa, Jordan, Lena, and everyone in our communities are doing is so important. We need to keep pushing to create solutions that serve the common good. It's not always easy. It's not always easy, but it's worth the effort. Before we go, I just want to um, reiterate we're having uh, some community building events this summer with Lena. Um, look forward to seeing people at Mueller Park uh, this summer uh, with our pop up markets. Uh, those dates are June 18th, July 23rd, August 20th, and September 17th. Um, see more information about those in the coming days and weeks. Um, let's save the dates. Should be fun. We're going to have a lot of local business vendors. Um, Melissa is planning to be there with Minneapolis Yoga. Hope to see um, everyone else. We're going to have uh, restorative practitioners, local business vendors, food, music. It's going to be a lot of fun and a family-friendly event. Uh, I'm at Mueller Park. Um, until we meet again, please keep supporting local businesses, keep showing up for local events, keep giving back to the community, look for ways to get involved with organizations and individuals, people who are doing positive work in the community, help them continue to good work, do good work in our community and across Minneapolis. It takes a community for a city to thrive and we are all interconnected. Putting positive energy and actions into our city is how we can strengthen our city and help every neighborhood grow stronger. Thank you all again uh, for being here. Have a great night. Good night.